Hello and welcome to the Shared Value Initiative Speaker Series. I'm Bobby Silton, Managing Director of the Shared Value Initiative. We're a global platform for leaders seeking to address societal challenges through business solutions. Today, we have Alan Murray, the author of the recently published book, Tomorrow's Capitalists, My Search for the Soul of Business, here in conversation with Mark Kramer to discuss his new book. The world is facing fundamental challenges, climate change, systemic inequity, workforce transitions, and more. Corporate leaders and companies have been asked to take the lead in addressing these challenges, which is driving a transformation of the corporate world. As a journalist who speaks with corporate CEOs every day, Alan has a unique and informed point of view of this transition, which he covers in his book, Tomorrow's Capitalist. But before I introduce our speakers, I just wanna take a moment to thank our generous sponsors who make this entire speaker series possible. We have Discovery, Anel, Merck, Truist, Walmart, Abbott and Sanofi. I just really want to say thank you to all of them for supporting the speaker series, for making it free to the public. And I just want to thank them overall for their support of the Shared Value Initiative. Now let me introduce our speakers. Alan Murray is the CEO of Fortune Media. He's also the co-host of a terrific podcast called Leadership Next that he does with Ellen McGirt. He's a lifelong journalist and according to his LinkedIn profile, he began at the age of nine. He specializes in business and politics and is committed to quality journalism. Mark Kramer is a senior lecturer at Harvard Business School where he teaches a course on purpose and profit. He also teaches an executive education course on creating shared value. And for those of you interested in this course, it's terrific. The registration for the October session is now open. So please check it out. He's also the co-founder of FSG and the Shared Value Initiative. So Mark, I'm gonna now hand it over to you and we look forward to the conversation that you're gonna have with Alan. Thank you, Bobby. And uh, good afternoon or good morning, Alan. It's great to see you. Uh, to and really a pleasure here. to have a chance to have read your book, which just came out um, uh, a week or two ago uh, and to be able to uh, have this conversation with you. Um, so you, you subtitled the book, My Search for the Soul uh, of Capitalism and of Corporations. And I, not everybody on this call would necessarily expect business to have a soul. So I'm curious why you chose that subtitle and, and why the timing for this book seems so relevant at the moment. Yeah, so, uh, well, first of all, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Bobby, for having me here. You you all do such great work at the Shared Value Initiative, and, I, I, I'm, and we're early movers in this movement uh, that I'm writing about in the book. So it's an honor for me to be with you and to talk about the uh, book with you and, and your audience. Uh, and Mark, you and I have had this conversation before. I mean, you said it yourself. I, I came at this as, as a journalist, really, as someone who has always thought about my role as, as more to explain the world than, than to change the world. Um, and, and, but, but I did begin hearing more and more talk about a, a different way of talking about business over the course of the last decade. And I, I think the work you did and the, the work the Shared Value Initiative has done over the course of that decade has been very much a part of it. And, and to, to kind of simplify, and then we can go deeper into pieces of this that you're most interested in, it's really about companies becoming more human. I mean, of course, companies have always been organizations of people, but the truth is that in the 20th century, a lot of management was really focused on making people act more like machines. <laughs> like, you know, how do we create, get everybody to do their part and be part of the cog in the great corporate machine? And as we move into the 21st century, what's increasingly clear is that's not where the value comes from anymore. It's not plugging people into some great pile of physical and financial capital. It's, it's the human skills that are creating the value. And so corporations are becoming much more human. I know that sounds very general and broad to say it, but we can talk about specifically what that means. And human organizations, 
have values. Uh, and, and I hear this more and more from CEOs. And if you have a set of values, in some sense, you have a soul. And so that's really what led to the subtitle of the book and kind of describes my exploration. Now, people keep asking me, well, did you find it? <laughs> Do corporations have a soul? Uh, I, I don't, I think this is unfinished work, uh, but I think there are a lot of trend lines in place that show that companies have to become much and much more people-centric, much more human-focused. And so I, I think over time, the soul is developing. And, and you point out that the nature of capital has really shifted from companies having their advantage on physical and financial capital to now it really being about human capital, and that this is what it takes to really engage workers meaningfully in their work. And it's such a huge and I think probably underappreciated change. And here's just a simple, you know, if you, if you want to think of one fact that captures what has happened, use this one. If you look at the balance sheets of the Fortune 500 companies in the 1970s, so 50 years ago, and, and tried to determine where the value of those companies was coming from, more than 80% of the value on the balance sheets of Fortune 500 companies was stuff, physical capital. It was plant, it was equipment, it was inventory on the shelves, it was oil in the ground, it was stuff you could touch and feel. And by the way, stuff that required financial capital to build, create, hold, support. Um, so it's kind of understandable in that kind of a world that there would be so much focus on return to the people who are providing the capital, the shareholders. But if you do the same exercise today, you look at the balance sheets of Fortune 500 companies, what you see is more than 85% of the value is intangibles. Well, what is what are intangibles? It's intellectual property, it's code, it's uh, uh, research and development, it's the brand value, the human connection that the company has made with its customers. Um, uh, all of these things are much more attached to people, the people who work for the company, the people who are served by the company. Um, and it's just changed the dynamics of successful businesses in some pretty profound ways. And, you know, one of the great pleasures of reading this book, you have a very engaging writing style, uh, but you also, as Bobby mentioned, are at the center of conversations with CEOs from many of the world's largest companies and, and have been for many years. And so you really are able to sort of follow how those conversations have changed and what the CEOs are saying today. But I'm actually just working on an article that will come out in the fall in Harvard Business Review where we've looked at the contrast between what companies are saying and their sustainability commitments and their financial forecasts and business models. And we've seen more than a few examples where a company can't possibly achieve its sustainability goal at the same time it's going to achieve its financial results. Yeah. So how yeah, do you know this is really happening and not just something that CEOs are trying to put across? Well, uh, so I'm a journalist. I work in anecdotes, collection of anecdotes. You're right. I feel very privileged. I've had a great life. I have a unique perch from which to have these conversations, literally hundreds of conversations with CEOs. And I do what journalists do, you know, when they tell me that they're trying to uh, address such and such uh, goal, I say, well, show me the specifics and tell me why you're doing it. Um, uh, and, and it's I've had enough of those conversations and accumulated enough anecdotes that I became convinced something real and lasting was going on here, that it wasn't all a bunch of sort of public relations hot air. That's not to say that there isn't a lot of public relations hot air. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, there certainly is. And to, and to answer your question, like, so how do we know what is public relations hot air and what is real? Uh, it's really going to come down to developing a system of metrics and accountability that is widely agreed on so we can make comparisons and we can hold companies accountable. And, and that, that doesn't happen overnight. I mean, think about it. The, the 
infrastructure that supports shareholder capitalism took over 100 years to build and it's massive you have the big four accounting firms and all the the you know the financial teams of, of, on these big companies but they have a set of agreed upon protocols for measuring return to shareholders you still have screw ups you know you have the world comms and the enrons and the accounting scandals but for the most part we have over the course of 100 years gotten pretty good at measuring and holding companies accountable for their financial returns. We are just at the beginning of doing that for these stakeholder goals. I mean, the SEC put out a 500 page proposed rule uh, a few weeks ago on uh, trying to get its arms around sustainability metrics. You know, are you really doing what, what you're saying you're doing? How do we know that? How do we measure that? I suspect in, within the next two years, you'll see the SEC do something similar on diversity. We've tried to do that at Fortune in partnership with Refinitiv by calling on companies to publicly disclose the data they report to the uh, EEOC. Um, uh, uh, the theory being that until we can see this data and hold companies accountable, we're not really gonna know whether progress is happening. So I think we're in the very early stages of building the infrastructure to answer the questions you're asking, but it's clear to me we're, we're moving in that direction. That's great. And we certainly have seen a lot of progress in thinking about how to measure social impact of companies, how to compare their performance on sustainability issues and so on. So I, I completely agree that holding companies accountable is the answer and that we are, at least beginning to make progress. And, and, and look, and, 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 and think about it again, I'm a, I'm a journalist, I'm not a social scientist. I do this more with anecdotes. Uh, uh, I don't have the data because the data doesn't yet exist. But let me, let me use a, a couple of anecdotes. Um, uh, Mary Barra, the CEO of General Motors said a year and a half ago, uh, came out publicly committed to, to a very clear measurable goal that's not too far in the future. By 2035, we will no longer make uh, uh, cars that, that uh, pollute, that emit carbon. Um, so, you know, the internal combustion engine, I assume that means will be gone by 2035. I can tell you from conversations I've had since then with board members and other people at GM, there's not a thing that happens at General Motors today that doesn't have to take that pledge into account because in, in for a car company that builds plants and has to make long-term plans on on their output 2035 is pretty damn close uh so you know that's that's just one example uh um i i just again i'm i'm fortunate to be able to have these conversations it was a few months ago uh soren sku who is the ceo of muller maersk they do the shipping giant shipping vessels that travel all over the globe had just announced a huge investment with Orsted, the Danish power company, to put wind farms uh, up in the North Sea somewhere that would power uh, plants to create hydrogen-based shipping fuels. Hugely expensive undertaking, not at all clear that it's going to become economic anytime soon. And so my question to him was, why are you doing this? And what he said to me was, I'm doing this because I get calls once a week from my customers who say, hey, I just made this 20, 20, uh, 20, 30, 20, 40 commitment to get the carbon out of my transportation supply chain. And you got to do this for me <laughs> because I committed to doing it 10 years from now. And if, if, if you don't do it, I'm going to have to find somebody else to get my goods from point A to point B. So you're really starting, we're talking just about the environment now, but you're really starting to see these spillover effects that make it very clear to me that real things are happening at very large scale because of these public relations commitments. Yep, that's great. And, and of course, you, you talk about the sort of activist CEO uh, as no longer being uh, kind of a rare exception, uh, but as now sort of being part of the job of the CEO. Uh, how did that uh, shift happen? And what's an example where a CEO has really made a difference through his or her activist role? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is one of the most interesting and controversial pieces of this development. But 
again, once you accept the fact that corporations are human organizations and therefore that they do have values, things that they stand for, and the people who work for them understand what those values are and expect them to stand up for the, their, those values, then these sorts of things will happen. And, and this is really very much a product of just the last decade. I mean, I can tell you as a journalist uh, 10 years ago, if you had something happen like, uh, uh, well, I'll give you a, a, a few examples. I mean, it really kind of started with Mark Benioff in Indiana when Indiana passed its religious liberties law in, I think, 2015 that was seen as uh, uh, discriminating against the LGBTQ community. And Mark Benioff publicly said, you know, if you're going to do this, we're not going to operate in Indiana anymore. And it had a huge, it did have a huge effect. I believe they repealed the most onerous parts of that, of that law. Now you can say, well, that's easy for Mark Benioff because he's a tech company and they all live on the left coast. And this is a more complicated political situation. But then it wasn't long after that, that North Carolina passed a bill limiting transgender access to public bathrooms and a whole swath of companies, including Bank of America, uh, not exactly a woke uh, uh, corporation and the biggest employer in the state of North Carolina said you can't do that and and got again got the bill repealed. Uh, Ed Bastian based in Atlanta, Georgia decided to take after the Parkland shootings take away a, a program a discount program for people going to the NRA convention which got him in hot water with the, the state legislature. Uh, uh, Ken Frazier, the CEO of Merck, led the revolt against Trump's advisory councils after the protests in Charlottesville. So that has really, and then of course, the biggest example of all, Mark, is the one we've seen in the last couple of months, where hundreds of companies voluntarily decided to shut down their operations in Russia. Not because they had to by sanctions, some had to because of sanctions, but most of them did it because they felt it was the right thing to do to stand up for the values that they uh, believed in. So, so, so this thing is really, this piece of it has really taken off very quickly. Now, um, I say it's the most charged, you know, look at what happened to Bob Chappick, the CEO of Disney in Florida. Uh, yeah. he, took the, he took the time-honored approach for the first two weeks. He said, oh my God, uh, you know, Florida's passed this controversial law saying you can't talk about gender identity in schools and uh, I don't want to get involved. I, I don't want to say anything. And so for two weeks, he said nothing. And by the end of that two weeks, he had a revolt on his hands. Some of his most valuable employees, you know, the, the Hollywood creative community was marching outside of his door and screaming. And so it was a serious, and again, that that's not just political wokeness. That's the engine of Disney the most valuable assets of the company saying, we're going to walk out of here if you, if, you do, if you don't say something. And so he finally felt forced to comment. And of course, when he did comment, then the state, the state legislature of Florida came down on him like a ton of bricks uh, um, and, and is now taking away the special status that, that Disney World has in Florida. That's a really difficult situation, but I think the lesson there is you can't avoid it. Um, if you're going to be a human-centered organization and if your value is coming from people, uh, you, you have to have values yourself and you have to understand what those people expect of you. And uh, um, it, it's, not, it's not an easy world, but it's a very different world than 20 years ago. Yes, and I think one of the interesting tensions the book raises is the, the relationship between business and government. Uh, yeah. which is not only the sort of tit for tat of the activist and the uh, uh, government responding uh, with penalties, uh, but also you point out that government hasn't done a great job of solving a lot of our social and environmental problems and that there's a need for business uh, to play a role uh, as part of the solution here. So, so how do you see this shift playing out? Yeah, it's such a, it, it, that's such a big change. You know, when I began my career in the 1970s, business defined the, the right side of the political spectrum. You know, the American Enterprise Institute was the, the, the source of conservative truth. And so 
business was was the uh, right wing in many ways. But but of course, what's happened is that our our politics have splintered and headed off in these crazy non-productive uh, directions where they seem to be less interested in solving problems, more interested in dividing the public in a way that helps them in the next election. Uh, and I think business leaders at some point said this 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 doesn't work. Uh, you know, I, I I think 2000, I say in the book, I think 2016 was an important year for many businesses for a couple of reasons. One was the Brexit vote in the UK earlier in that year, which was what, you know, I think every business leader said, wait a minute, we said very clearly, this is a bad idea. Don't do it. And yet we were ignored. And the public voted the other way. What's going on? And then in the US, you had this wild election where on the Republican side, you had a candidate, Donald Trump, who was repudiating free trade and globalization, all the things that had made these companies successful. And on the other side, you had uh, Bernie Sanders almost uh, making it to the nomination, running as a socialist. Uh, and, and business leaders started saying two things. One is, where do we fit in this equation? Neither of these, part, neither of these uh, candidates represents us. But two, who's going to solve the problems? Because we got some pretty big problems. You know, there is, a, there is a climate problem that has to be addressed because we can't survive in the long run as businesses if the climate is burning. There is a social problem. The, the escalator of mobility and opportunity seems to be broken. Uh, and there's a growing inequality issue that if we don't solve, there'll be a, 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 a social revolt that will make it impossible for us to operate as businesses. So part of what was going on, in addition to the fundamental changes in the nature of business, was a sense that these may be problems that in theory are best left to government, but the government's not dealing with them. And if we don't deal with them, we won't survive. So that was definitely a big part of, uh, of the, the push over the last five, six years to get more involved in these uh, big social issues. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you, you talk about uh, the role of purpose and how important that is for companies. And of course, that's part of what's behind their getting involved in these issues. But I'll confess, I've always struggled with uh, sort of what is the mechanism how does purpose translate into better performance for a company? What's the link other than just the public relations benefit? It's, it's, it's first and foremost employees. I mean, there are other pieces to this, but I can tell you having, again, I've had hundreds of these conversations over the course of the decade. And one of the questions I always ask when somebody talks about some great new environmental initiative or some social initiative that they're doing that isn't, ju isn't clearly justified by the short-term economics of the situation, I always say, why are you doing this? And the, answer, the most common answer, the answer more than 90% of the time is because of my employees. Uh, you know, we, we, talk a lot about the great resignation and the battle for talent that's going on right now, which has been hypercharged by the pandemics. The two things about the pandemic, one is a lot of people left the labor market. The other is a lot of money was put into the financial market, creating demand. So you have more demand, less supply. And that's, that's hypercharged the, the fight for talent. But the fight for talent was building long before the pandemic. And most people I talk to think will be going on long after the pandemic. And so the, the most important reason why companies tell me today they need to have a strong purpose and they need to act on that purpose is because they want good people to want to work for them. And, and you know, Mark, it's, it's become even more important in the kind of post office world that we're entering. I mean, we we all worked in offices, obviously not all of us, but a, half of us uh, worked in offices. And then we all went home for two years. And now we're all kind of coming back, but not really coming back, coming back in a hybrid world. And a lot of leaders are saying to themselves, geez, my office was kind of my culture, right? People were here all day long and they went to lunch together and they went for drinks after work together. And that became the office culture. And it's not going to be nearly as much 
of the culture in the future. So how do I hold people together? How, what, what is the emotional bond that's going to make them want to be a part of this organization? And, and in the conversations I'm having, uh, more and more people are saying, well, it has to be our purpose. We have to double down on our purpose. We have to make it clear to people why we exist, what good we're doing in the world and why they should be a part of it. You know, I think there is, by the way. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, just go ahead. one other aspect. I do think there's a generational piece to this too. Um, uh, when the, the two years I was running the Pew Research Center, we did some research on the millennial generation. And, and what you realize when you look at that data is, they, this is a generation that what is much slower to get married, uh, much less likely to belong to organized religion. Uh, they may be religious, but much less likely to be part of an organized church. They're not big joiners, much less likely to be part of a rotary club or a moose club or whatever. And, and what that means is you spit that data long enough is that the employer has become their primary and in many cases their only formal connection to society. Uh, and so all their hopes and expectations for their lives and their effect on the world get piled onto that employer. I mean, I, if I leave myself out of the equation because none of us are objective analyzing ourselves, but I know my father who was a child of the depression went to work for one reason. He went to work to make money. You know, if he wanted to do good in the world he was more likely to do that at his church or at the Rotary Club or whatever but he went to work to make money. When I have conversations with my children who are uh, 29 and 31, they have a completely different set of expectations for their jobs, uh, what they expect from it. They wanna know that they're working for somebody who's doing good in the world. I mean, they want the money, I don't make no mistake about that, but they wanna know that they're part of something bigger than uh, a money-making machine. So. So I do think gen uh, generational change is part of what we're dealing with. Yeah, and that's that's such an important point about sort of rethinking how to define corporate culture if we're not all in the office together and how to adapt to the needs of new generation. And of course, when you talk about talent, that also raises the question of how do we define talent and how do we think about diversity and different kinds of talent. And of course, that's another shift you talk about in the book is that, you know, we've talked about diversity in the corporate setting for decades, but something seems to have shifted there. And we seem to be thinking about things a little differently. I, I was particularly struck by the example of eliminating a four degree college requirement for many jobs, which IBM of all companies had done and how that you know, opens up opportunity and how these kinds of things that we sort of took for granted were real barriers to the sort of diversity and inclusion that we really need to bring into our companies. Yeah, and so look, again, this is all anecdotal. Uh, we don't have good data on this and it's not at all clear that it's happening at large enough scale to influence the data, but, but since uh, the... George Floyd moment, there's been a lot, I find, as somebody who's been watching this stuff and talking about it for four decades, much more serious action on this front. One example is what you talked about, a number of big companies that have agreed collectively to get their uh, HR teams to go through all their job listings and say, let's not say you have to have a four-year degree if you don't have to have a four-year degree, because we're just writing off uh, half the potential workforce. Let's be very clear about what the skills are. And then also the best of companies are saying, and maybe we can help provide these skills. They're, they're, I can point you to a number of companies that are focusing more on apprenticeship programs. Let, let's bring people in maybe a little before they're ready, but commit to doing the preparation ourselves. So that sort of thing is definitely happening. You look at something like the 110 initiative that, uh, uh, that Ken Frazier of Merck and uh, Ken Chenault, the former CEO of American Express and a number of other, uh, uh, Charles Phillips, a number of others put together, which, which was basically getting companies to commit to hire not just diverse employees, but diverse employees from non-traditional backgrounds. Uh, let, let's, we, we, we can't just keep bidding for the same group of, of, of skilled diverse employees, we have to uh, create new pipelines, new escalators, new ways of getting people into the system. So there's a lot of really good, and, and some of it is local stuff. There's a group of companies in 
Chicago, uh, Accenture, Allstate, Hyatt, that have you know banded together to figure out what can we do here in the Chicago area to bring more people into the system. Again, I don't know if if these programs have yet reached the scale they need to to affect the numbers in the way they need to. But what I know is that there's a lot of real activity going on and, and activity that wasn't there three, four, five years ago. Yeah, and that's very hopeful. Uh, I know we're gonna take some questions from the audience in a few minutes, so be thinking about your questions. But I wanna ask, Alan, toward the end of the book, you sort of introduce the idea of capitalism 2.0 and say there's this potential here for a vision where it isn't a choice between purpose and profit, they can work together. It isn't investors versus other stakeholders. Stakeholder capitalism can look out for everyone's interests. And you say, we need to nurture this shift. We need to find ways to embrace it and help make it happen. And of course, people on this call are typically involved with the Shared Value Initiative, thinking about it very much in that camp. What do we need to do to drive this movement forward, to help embrace it, to help it grow, to help it really take root? Well, I think, I, I think the, the first answer is the one we've already talked about which is, you know, the fundamental notion that what gets measured gets managed. Uh, and that until it's measured, it's probably not going to be managed. Uh, and so getting the metrics in place that are that are uh, standardized, comparable, publicly available so that everybody can see exactly what you're doing and hold you accountable. And that's that's hard for a lot of companies. You know, on take diversity, for instance, nobody's doing that well. Um, and so companies aren't crazy about making public data that shows they aren't doing well. Um, but until that starts to happen, and it is growing slowly, uh, until that starts to happen, you're probably not going to see real progress. Now, I, I, I think some of this is now going to come from the government. I, we already talked about the uh, uh, the proposed rule that the SEC has put out on sustainability. My guess is there'll be one on diversity as well. So the government may start requiring companies to make this public. But I think getting the getting the measurement infrastructure in place and and being public about your commitments and your metrics so that people can hold you accountable is going to be key. Terrific. Well, I see we have one question that came in from the audience, and it's a point you do uh, discuss in the book about the challenge between long term versus short term. And, and a lot of these changes you're talking about, a lot of the uh, developments that seem so important to the long term success of companies carry short term costs. So right. is there really a shift in thinking and will investors tolerate companies thinking more about the long term? Yeah, it's a great question. Look, I spent uh, <clears throat> I spent a year of my life in the C-suite of a company that no longer exists called Time Inc. Uh, as the chief content officer, and I and we were under attack from an activist, and I saw with my own eyes the kinds of decisions that companies can make uh, to achieve quarterly earning results that clearly aren't in the long-term interests of the company. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I can point to many of them, um, but you're right about time frame. is over time, you know, over time, those, those, the interests of society and the interests of the company tend to converge. Uh, again, you can't be a successful company on a burning planet. You can't be a successful company if society is in revolt. Uh, all of those, you can't be a successful company if you repeatedly push uh, uh, fraudulent products onto your customers. Um, in the long term, these things come together. It was interesting to me, Mark, uh, when you know when the Business Roundtable decided to put out its in August of 2019 its statement on stakeholder capitalism, saying that that employees, customers, the communities they live in, and the natural environment are all as important to us as our shareholders. It was interesting that the four CEOs who drove that effort with inside the business roundtable were Mary Barra of GM, Alex Gorski of Johnson & Johnson, Jamie Dimon of JP Morgan, Ginny Rometty of IBM. Every one of those companies has been around for more than 100 years. Uh, uh, 
So, um, so I, I do think there is, there is clearly a, a coincidence of uh, stakeholder thinking and long-term thinking. I don't think long-term thinking or stakeholder thinking is prevalent in every business yet today, but I think it's important to understand that those two things go hand in hand in order to keep this movement moving in the right direction. That's great. Uh, there's another question that came in asking about sort of tri-sector partnership. And you, you talk about the need for greater partnership between business and nonprofit sector and government to actually address social problems. And yet it still seems like most of us are sort of at each other's throats rather than collaborating together. How, how, and it seems like that's a difficult muscle uh, for companies to build, uh, to work with others outside their walls. Uh, what advice do you have uh, either for community groups that want to be engaging more effectively with companies or companies that want to engage more effectively with the other sectors? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a good question because competition is sort of built into the structure and motivations of companies. And so the notion that, hey, on some of these things, we have to collaborate uh, is that's not a natural act. Um, I do find more and more CEOs recognizing that and talking about it, but I think anybody who's at one of these companies can play an important role in, in just constantly making that clear that this is when you're talking about the environment, this is, you know, we may get a competitive advantage out of doing the right thing, but this is for collective goals, not for individual goals. And I think we're going to all have to get better at understanding where we compete and where we collaborate. Uh, in order to succeed. I, I'll tell you a great inspiring example of that is what happened in the pharmaceutical industry over the last two years. I mean, this was in some ways the most hated industry in the world, certainly, in, or at least in this country. Uh, there were numerous polls that showed that because uh, people saw them as, as uh, you know, jacking up prices and, gra uh, and, and trying to maintain uh, uh, patents longer than they should, all as an effort to increase profits and all at the expense of public, often seemingly at the expense of public health. Uh, and during the pandemic, you saw a very different set of behaviors where uh, the companies were all working together, giving each other their manufacturing facilities to help make the, the vaccines or, and the treatments that have proven effective. It was, it was stunning. I mean, the industry has been, you talk to somebody like Albert Borla at Pfizer, he'll tell you the company is, is a different company. The whole ethic and, and purpose, as we were talking about, is different than it was uh, two years ago. Um, so it, it is a great example of how getting behind a common purpose that requires suspending the rules of competition and collaborating with people who were normally your enemies can actually be a powerful driver of engagement and success. I mean, who knew we could invent those vaccines within, uh, within a year's time? And just to stick with the Pfizer example for a second, you know, what they did was even more fundamental than that because they early on made a decision that the new technology that was being developed by BioNTech, their partner, the mRNA technology, was probably more power than the traditional, more powerful than the traditional technology that they did themselves. So normal competitive thinking would have said, well, we're going to use our technology, but uh, but they made the decision early on to go with this outsider technology and to partner with uh, BioNTech. I think that was an extraordinary moment. And it was done for uh, because they felt it was the right thing for society. Yep. No, it's true. And we, we certainly are all grateful that, that they were able to respond as they did. Uh, one of the comments coming in uh, notes that you said this is really about companies becoming more human. And that suggests a profound change in business leadership. Yeah. And how will we get this kind of shift in consciousness of leaders to make it more widespread and more real? I think it's happening and it's not happening. I don't know that it's, you know, it's not something that people learn in business school to my experience anyway. Uh, many CEOs are engineers. It's certainly not something you learn in engineering school, but I was struck, I read recently, there's a new book coming out, maybe it's already come out or coming out in the next week or two by uh, David Gellis about Jack Welch. And it's kind of a cultural reappraisal of Jack Welch. I don't think there's a whole lot of uh, new information on it, 
but it's just reading it was a reminder of what a different that's only 20 years ago right when he retired what a different world he was operating in than, than the ceos today and in, in jack welch's world vulnerability weakness was something you never showed right um uh uh, my favorite example from the pandemic, and I would urge uh, you and your your uh, audience who haven't looked at this to go look at it. It's a two minute Twitter vid video that was made by Arnie Sorensen, uh, who was the CEO of, of, of Marriott um, at the time when he realized that his business had evaporated. You know, in the early days of the pandemic, occupancy rates at hotels went to like single digit percentage points. He couldn't possibly keep he was going to have to furlough vast numbers of his employees and he he shot and so he had to communicate this to thousands and thousands of people at the same time and so he went on twitter you know recognized that there was no point in trying to separate the communication to the employees to the communication of the rest of the world he filmed a video on twitter describing why he was doing what he was doing and all the things he was going to do to try and ameliorate it for the people who were affected it it it, it's it's an incredibly poignant video. The poignancy is increased by the fact that he personally was fighting with cancer at the time, visibly, uh, and 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 subsequently died uh, from uh, from the cancer. But that video was unlike any anything I had ever seen in four decades of covering corporate leadership. You know, to to the the importance of empathy, the importance of 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 creating a sense of vulnerability so that you can connect with your employers. It's just a very different way of leading. Just one other thing about the different way of leading. You know, the 20th century corporation was built as kind of an information hierarchy. You had all these people in the field and they'd collect information. The information would go up the hierarchy, it would get to the top, they'd sit in the boardroom, they'd formulate a strategy, and then they'd tell everybody what to do and that would go back down. Nobody runs their company that way. You can't. It takes too long. First of all, information doesn't flow vertically. It flows omnidirectionally. Second, if you wait for the people at the top to tell you what to do, you're going to be way too late because the world is moving too fast. And so, and so you think about what that means to the people at the top. Their job today is much less about telling people what to do and much more about inspiring them, creating a sense of purpose, creating a North Star, creating the moral guardrails that keep people keep the, the folks in the field who have now all this new power from going astray. Um, uh, it's just a very different job that requires a degree of ability to communicate and to empathize and to connect uh, and to, and to uh, exude um, purpose and authenticity that, that wasn't required 20, 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. Well, Alan, I wish we could keep talking. It is such a delight to talk to you. And I hope people listening get a sense of what a delight it is to read the book, because one gets to basically continue the conversation we've been having uh, in print with Alan. And that is a great treat and a great pleasure. So, Alan, thank you so much for being with us. And thank you for playing your part in helping this transformation happen in business in the world today, which will certainly lead to a better world in the future. So well, back, you. Uh, back at you, Mark, and back at uh, all the people on this call who recognized probably much earlier than I did that something needed to be changed in the way we, we do this. And I congratulate the Shared Value Initiative for all the uh, uh, important role that it's played in this progress. Thank you, Alan, and it's been great to have your support and engagement with us. Bobby, let me hand this back to you for a final. All right. Well, thank you so much. What a fantastic conversation. I wish we could have kept this going, but uh, get the book. Alan, congratulations on the success. And also, I think you achieved your goal of explaining the world to us today. I think we all learned a little bit uh, from this conversation. So appreciate all your insights and sharing and Mark, always thank you for your thoughtful questions and the illuminating discussion. We really appreciate it. Before we sign off, I just want to make a couple of announcements. The Fortune Change the World list call for applications is now open, and it will be open through July 15th. So please submit your application either on the Shared Value Initiative website or at the Fortune website. On June 7th at 10 a.m. Eastern, we're going to have Francesco Starace, the CEO of the Enel Group. They are a leader in renewable energy and shared value. 
He's going to be in conversation with Demi Lola Ogumbi, the CEO of Sustainable Energy for All. They're going to be discussing access, innovation, and leadership to drive a clean energy revolution. So I hope you'll join us for that interesting conversation. I want to thank the folks behind the scenes who made this webinar possible, Gail Gershon, Georgie Eckert, and Emily Mosler. Thank you for all your help. And of course, thank you to all of you in our audience for being with us today. I hope you found this conversation as valuable as I did, and we hope to see you again at another Shared Value Initiative event. Thank you.